วิเกิดปะโมหันไดคือพาโลที่มาคปะคุสซาคาลี That's very good in many language. Very good. Monks are very good. They can just fix things up on their own. They can even fix people up. Anyone's got a screw loose in their brain, come and see this monk. He will fix you. <laughs> Oops. Very good. So, you don't need my permission. Please come in, go out, whatever you want to do. Yeah, that's good. And we have a talk. Once everyone is settled down, I'm sorry I've been away for a couple of weeks. I wasn't here last weekend, and the reason was because I was teaching overseas. And for those of you who don't know where I was last week, it was in one of the places you would least expect a monk. Las Vegas. <laughs> I was. And if you want to know what I did in Las Vegas, there's a big sign in the airport when you leave. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, I was just—I wasn't going into any casinos. I was just teaching uh, people how to be good and how to be wise. Teaching a group of health professionals who have to look after people who don't look after themselves. So I thought it was an appropriate subject, having just been to Las Vegas and back and survived, uh, to talk about gambling. <laughs> Because gambling does affect many people in our society, and it's something which we haven't talked about at all. I think in all these these discourses which I've given on a Friday night over the years, and that's actually what gambling is, and why it happens, and what it's teaching us about ourselves, and how to avoid all the pain and suffering of things. But first of all, some years ago, somebody. Uh, gave us some instructions about the difference between gaming and gambling. Because when we were building our retreat c e n t e r we didn't have enough money, and you can get some money for such projects from lotteries commission if you're a religion. Now, religions have certain advantages, and even in Las Vegas, I was in Las Vegas and also in Toronto, in Canada. And so many people kept asking me, "Is Buddhism a religion?" And I kept the same, giving the same answer: Yes, it is a religion for tax purposes and other benefits, because <laughs> we're very practical. And so you do get many benefits if you say you're a religion. And we are a religion for extents and purposes. We're philosophy, a psychology, and many other things too. But that's part of this: is we're a religion. And so if you're a religion, you're allowed to get some grants from the lotteries commission. And first we thought: Is that ethical? You know, from the Buddhists to get money from gambling, and what was explained to me was a very good distinction between gaming and gambling. What gaming is is when you have a raffle or you have a lottery, and really you have not a, a snowball's chance in hell of winning, and you know that. <coughs> so you're just doing it for a bit of fun, or just like the raffles we have for raising funds for this or the other. And apparently, that. Uh, Ronnie was telling me we're having a raffle for the nuns' monastery next. I think it was a couple of weeks' time. Ronnie, where's she gone? Anyway, it's a couple of weeks' time. Having a raffle for something or other. There's always raffles going on in these clubs and societies like ours. I'm not sure what she's raffling off. It's probably me, <laughs> or anything else which people want. But anyway, they're raffling off something or other. That when you buy a ticket for a raffle. Really, you don't expect to win anything. It's just a way of making a donation for a good cause uh, and having a bit of fun at the same time. When you have the draw to see who wins, but a lot of time you're not really doing it for any advantage. It's just for fun. And they said that's what gaming is. When you're having a raffle and you know you haven't got any chance of winning, you're just doing it for a bit of fun. Giving some money away to a good cause, and it's just a bit of entertainment. And that same thing happens. And as a Buddhist monk and an ethicist, 
that if you say go to Burswood Casino, our local casino here, and you're just going for a night out and you just have $100 or $50 and it's just a way of, you know, just seeing if you can have a bit of fun. That's not really dangerous or bad you just fifty dollars is gone a hundred dollars is gone you've had a good time that's just the price of a night out for many of you it's much better to spend that night out at a place like this center over here because okay you have a nice night out you hear a few funny stories and get something good out of this and you can put the hundred dollars in the box in the back it goes to a much better cause than Burswood Casino and you do get us some entertainment because the first funny story, those who've been to my monastery have heard me say this before, a true story. It's one of the reasons why especially monks and spiritual people have got to be very careful of gaming or gambling or anything because of our powers. But when you use your powers, you get into big trouble all the time. And this story was the one of a famous Buddhist nun. She's passed away now, not one of our nuns down at our monastery, so, so they're much more, uh, they are more well trained because I'm their trainer. But anyway, <laughs> this nun was teaching a meditation retreat in England. And having finished the retreat, she was being driven from the retreat place to Heathrow Airport. And on the way, they stopped for lunch. If any of you have been to UK, you know some of the restaurants are right next to the pubs. Traditionally, the pub, the bar, has been like a hostelry to take people who are travelling and give them a room for the night and food to eat. So there was a good little restaurant next to the pub, but to actually get into the restaurant, you just had to pass the front of the pub a long way from the bar and go into the restaurant. So she had her meal, and the driver, who I know very well, she's from Sydney, she was, uh, had a few English coins left, and instead of taking them all the way back to Australia, it's a waste of time changing them. If you had a change like 10 pounds or 20 pounds, the change fee is 30 pounds, so you end up having to pay the person. You don't get anything back at all. So, she had a few coins, so there's one of these slot machines. You know what they call the pokies here in Australia. You know those things, the, the one-armed bandits, that was the name they used to call them. You put the, slot, the money in the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the slot and you pull the handle down. It goes round and round and round to see if you get jackpot or three bars or gold, whatever it is, to see if you can win. I'm sure you all know those. So this uh, driver was putting a few coins in there just when the nun walked out. And she said to this nun, I haven't got good karma. You're a Buddhist nun, a teacher, quite famous. You've got the good karma, so please pull the handle for me. And she did. Now that was a moment, a lack of wisdom. Because what happened next, absolutely true story, the only time she's ever pulled the handle in her life, round, 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 jackpot. <laughs> it came jackpot. All the bells ringing, and all this money poured out in front of this nun. We're not even allowed to touch the stuff. And she was covered in it. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't so bad. The worst part was everybody in the pub went quiet. You know, people don't usually go quiet in a pub. They're always talking and shouting at each other and cracking jokes. Everyone went quiet because they saw this strange Buddhist nun who just won the jackpot. <laughs> And then the silence was broken by the barman who picked up a bell and rang it, ding, 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 ding. And the barman then explained to the Buddhist nun, it was a custom, it was a rule, that whoever won the jackpot had to buy a free round of drinks for every patron in the pub. And so this was the first time in 2,500 years that a Buddhist nun had to buy whiskies and beers and gin and tonics for other people. <laughs> and she had no choice. So that's one of the dangers of getting monks or nuns to do these things. The danger is we win. <laughs> and now I've told you that story, you're going to go try and get me. Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm, can you please come to Burswood just once? Just, I'll put the money in, you just pull the handle. <laughs> Now the problem is, with gaming, it's just for fun. You're just trying to get rid of money for a good cause, a nice evening out, that's not a problem. 
when you don't expect to win. It's when we expect to win, it becomes gambling. And this is interesting because it seems to me that people are so stupid that they think they can influence the odds. They should know your chances of winning are absolutely zero. But nevertheless, you put that coin into the slot machine and then you do your chanting, come on. Or you, you pray to your ancestors because out of stupidity you think you can influence the odds. In the same way, I've seen people and when I was young, they, well, probably some of you did this recently. You're watching the London Olympics in your sitting room here in Perth. And you're shouting at the competitor, come on, run faster, run faster. They can't hear you. You're in Perth. They're in London. But still you shout at them. Why? Because you think you can influence them. It's amazing. You can see even people at sports matches. Come on, the Eagles, come on, the Dockers, whatever your team is. Do you think you can influence those people who are playing? They're not listening to you, they're focusing on the ball. But nevertheless, because we have the conceit that we can influence people at a distance, that is the joy of spectator sport. We think if we shout hard enough, if we put enough will in the stands, that that team can score a goal. Do you think that works? Absolutely not. But that is the thing, we can influence the result. Which is why, even I was in Toronto, and some of my friends who were supposed to be looking after me, instead stayed up to the middle of the night, watching the US election. Come on, Obama, come on, come on, come on. Look, you can't influence anything. The votes are in. They're already being counted. But why is it that we believe that we can influence these things? This is one of the great conceits of human beings. Thinking that how much we, we really think we can control things if we put enough skill and will into what we're doing. Really, you are out of control. You do the same thing to your partner, trying to will them to be just like you want. You can't. You might as well stand in front of a poker machine. Please be jackpot, be jackpot. Your partner is not jackpot. Get used to it. <laughs> but that's what we do. We think that we can control the odds and change the world to suit us. And that is the myth of gambling. Why we think that somehow or other we're smarter than everybody else. That we can beat the odds. You can't beat the odds. It's a conceit of human beings to think we can. That we can control things which we should know are totally out of control. How many of you have been late for work and you've willed the traffic lights? Please, traffic lights, be green, be green, be green. I really need you this time. Please, please, please. There is no way in the world that your mind can influence any traffic light whatsoever, but still you do that. Please, 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 please. And that is the same stupidity which causes people to gamble. They really think that they can beat the odds. And they have all these ways of trying to beat those odds. They go to their lucky temple to pray, first of all. Or <laughs> they make these, these determinations. They come up to me, as they did. I'm not quite sure that just before I left to go to Toronto and Las Vegas, I think there was a hundred million lottery here in Australia. It was, and people were coming up to me. I jump on, I jump on. Please help me, please help me. Because I'll do a deal, I'll do a deal. If I win, I'll give you... Ten dollars for your monastery. <laughs> so, well, at least fifty-fifty. Come on, I do all the hard work. And they try and make these deals to try and give themselves an edge, so they think they're going to win. And of course, you can't do those deals. You can pray all you like. You can go to your lucky temple. You can make all these promises. If I win this time, I'll give all this money to this charity and that charity and this charity and that charity. No, it does not work. You cannot influence the odds through bribery. So people sometimes go to the church. They're not even, even Christians, but they go to the church anyway just to increase their odds. 
and they go to the mosque, and they go to the <laughs> synagogue. They go everywhere, every lucky place, trying to increase their odds. That is stupidity. Or they try and find a four-leaf clover. Actually, in our monastery, I showed a few people. We got a little patch. I'm not sure if it's still there. With it was about ten four-leaf clovers, and at least two. I've never seen this before. Two five-leaf clovers, the real ones. That's really lucky. I think four-leaf clover is supposed to be lucky, but a five-leaf clover, that's mega lucky. And of course, I never told anybody because that was just a few days before the $100 million draw. You'd have been taking all the clovers out of our monastery and denuding and turning into a desert. But why is it we think these things are lucky? It is because of some sort of delusion that somehow we could control the future somehow through these little rituals. Sometimes, hopefully, that there's a few Thai people here this evening. Thai people are crazy that way. They wear all these medallions around their neck, thinking that if they have a Buddha medallion, that's going to give them good luck. I'll tell you how lucky medallions are. There was a general in the Thai army about 10 or 15 years ago who had one of these lucky medallions which was worth a half a million dollars US. $500,000 US for one of these tiny medallions. He bought it because it was supposed to protect you from bullets. And if you're in an army and it actually can protect you from bullets, that's worth half a million dollars. But this general, he was ha just after dinner one evening, he was boasting about his medallion, as you do boast about things if you spend so much money on them. And he told one of his subordinate officers, a major, this medallion protects you from bullets. It cost me a half a mil. He said, I'll prove it. Here, major, this was a general talking, take my revolver and shoot me. That's an order. And so the Major took the General's revolver, pointed it at him, and shot the bullet. You know what happened? It's amazing. He died. <laughs> that stupid General died. It was in the newspapers here in Australia. Do you think that can protect you from bullets? Once Ajahn Chah, this is a great story, you've probably heard it before. Once Ajahn Chah, my master, he was really um, oppressed by one of his disciples who said, I'm going to have to join the army. I need a little Buddha to port around my neck to protect me from bullets. I know you can do this. Give me one. And Ajahn Chah said, no, that's superstition. We don't do that in Buddhism. He said, yeah, I know that's what you say to others, but I know that's not true. And I've looked after you. I've been giving donations. I've been giving you food, looking after you, taking you around. Don't you know gratitude, Ajahn Chah? I've looked after you for so many years, given so many don't, and all I ask for is a Buddha to protect me from bullets. Come on, show some gratitude. And now it's, gratitude is really important. If you've helped me, I have to help you. So Ajahn tells him, well, okay, just this once. I will give you a Buddha to wear around your neck which actually can protect you from bullets. I knew you could do that, I knew you could do that, said the man. Where's my Buddha? And Ajahn Chah said, it's that big Buddha like the one behind me here. <laughs> About three meters tall. Put that around your neck. That'll protect you from bullets. <laughs> the only one which can. But you see, we try and see if we can control the world. If you want to be protected from bullets, then don't join the army. Don't go to Northbridge on a Saturday night, which is you know, the rough area of Perth. You know, keep out of Iraq and Afghanistan, that's the last place to go to for holidays. But, <laughs> that's the trouble with people. Sometimes they think they can control the world through all these superstitions. That's ties. Sri Lankans, all these strings around your, your wrists. Does that really work? I've done many funerals where people have had strings around their wrists. It, it does not protect you. 
It may be give you a placebo effect, in other words, it encourages you to be a better person. Having a little Buddha around the neck is fine, because it reminds you of a Buddha. It's just like having an icon around your neck. Fine, but don't think it's going to be give you anything except inspiration and encouragement. But sometimes people have this superstition of luck. And they think that somehow or other, that they can defeat the system and go to a casino or do gambling and horse racing and they think they're going to win. If you think you're going to win, that's called gambling. If it's just for fun, you're doing it to lose anyway, just having a bit of enjoyment, just like you may bet in the Melbourne Cup, a sweepstake. You know, when they give you the horses, you know you're not going to get a horse which you can get anywhere near winning. But nevertheless, you know, it's a bit of fun. You have a good, good time with your friends on this. And you know, if you do win, you should share it with everybody anyway. So that's just gaming. That's just fun. That is okay. And I remember that. I have to say this. That, that is not a problem at all. Because that's, my father used to do that with myself and my brother. We used to, he never used to give us pocket money. Instead, he would just play you know, some poker or some, some solo or some other card game. And he would always lose. Every time he would lose. And it, it, I was smart enough to realize he was doing this on purpose. It was a way of giving his kids some pocket money, but we had to earn it, you know, be a bit smart. And it was a wonderful way of spending time with his children. So instead of just giving us $5 or $10, no, we had to sit down with him for an hour, play some cards, have a bit of fun, have time together. And he would always lose every time. That was our pocket money. And it was a unique way. And, that just showed me there was you know, playing a game of cards together. It wasn't for, for money, it was just for fun and just a way that a father can give pocket money to his kids. And we, had, you know, we got the idea we had to earn it, at least be smart and clever. And that was a very good lesson from a very wise father. And, you know, sometimes we would uh, gamble just on the, have a couple of horse races every year in the UK, and that was okay. We never really thought that we were going to win. It's just a bit of fun. You're watching the TV and you've got something to shout out and just something to sort of rib your brother. Your, your horse is really stupid. Yeah, but, you know, at least he finished. Yours fell over. <laughs> or whatever happened. But it's when we think we're going to win, that's a problem. And sometimes we do get signs. But when you get signs, be careful, don't gamble. Just because you get a sign doesn't mean you're going to win. Remember this guy who actually, you know, sometimes, if, especially if someone's just died, or sometimes you hear these voices, and he heard this voice. You know, he doesn't usually hear voices. He's not schizophrenic or anything. He heard this voice. This uh, some being said very clearly into his ears, go to the casino. And of course, you know, when you hear something like that, you think you're just imagining it. But he said it again. Go to the casino. And he looked around to see if there's anybody there. No one there. Go to the casino. And it was so clear as if someone was really speaking to him. So he actually thought it was a sign. So he went to the casino. And then he heard the voice again as soon as he walked into the door. Go to the roulette wheel. Go to the roulette wheel. And he heard it. So he went to the roulette wheel, and he heard the sound again. As soon as he sat down, or oh, got some chips, sat down. Put $50 on number six. It was really clear. He wasn't imagining it. So he put $50 on number six. And the croupier, whatever they call him, put the, the ball in the wheel, turned it around. The wheel went round and round and round, and it landed in number six. He said, put all the money on number 17. He heard that. So it's worked so far. He put all the money on number 70, put the wheel in there, turned it around, round, 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 ding, 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 and number 17. He wanted to walk away, but he heard it again and say, put all the, number, all the winnings on number 23. Number 23. He heard it. As clear as if someone was speaking to you. And the croupier put the ball in the, the roulette wheel, turned it around, round, around, around, boom, 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 in number 23 and then out into number 22, sitting next to it. And he heard very clearly the voice say, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of that story <laughs> is that even ghosts and spirits, they make mistakes as well, they can't be trusted. <laughs> so 
<laughs> don't just follow the system because you've got powers and you can hear it. So that's why, you know, don't trust me either because I make mistakes too. And don't go and blame me and sue the Buddhist society. Ajahn Brahm, you gave me this number, you gave me this. No, it does not work. So a lot of times that when we have this idea of winning and we go there because we think we can somehow control everything, sometimes we think we're better than everybody else. And that's another form of conceit. So we say, oh, well, other people lose because they're stupid, but I'm not stupid. And that's why you go and gamble. Take it from me, you're just as stupid as anybody else. This is one of those little tricks which sometimes you can do in an audience. To ask everybody, be honest with yourself. Do you really think you're above average intelligence or below average intelligence? Which one are you? Just below or above average intelligence? Don't say I'm just in the middle. No, you're just in the middle, just a little bit above, or middle and just a little bit below. And it's quite clear that usually about 90% of people think they're above average intelligence. 40% <laughs> of you are wrong. <laughs> but everybody thinks they're at least at or above average intelligence. Half of those people must be wrong. Only 50% of people are above average intelligence. It's obvious, isn't it? But we think that we are up that top 50% and not at the bottom 50%. It's the same with you parents. 50% of your kids are going to be below average intelligence. So stop scolding them for that. So you stupid kid. You say, look, I mean, some people have to be stupid. That's just me. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Otherwise, you're stigmatizing 50% of the population. You know that for many years now, we've been fighting against racism. And it's brilliant now, you know, which is everybody is just, doesn't matter what race you are, you are accepted. Genderism, you know, for many years the females just did not have equality. There's still some work to be done, but it's much, much better now. We made sure there was no gender inequality. And then, of course, gays, homosexuals, lesbians, they got pretty much equality. They've still got some work to do, but they're accepted as well. The next phrase of uh, fighting for equality is for the monks and nuns. Because too many people these days, I've read it in the newspapers, they say being celibate is unnatural. We can cure you if you come from a program. <laughs> Just like they used to say with gays, it's unnatural, we can cure you. Now we're getting the flack now. So I'm starting a movement for celibate rights. Stop discriminating against celibates if you don't want sex. That's up to you, for goodness sake. You don't have to. And it's not you're unnatural if you don't want sex. So celibate rights. And of course, the next thing we have to have is like stupid rights. <laughs> I demand my freedom to be stupid. <laughs> and to be respected for it. Because <laughs> 50% of the population are going to be below average intelligence. And they should be respected as much as anybody else. And then maybe, then maybe we won't be pushing our kids always to be in the top 50%. You're making 50% of the population try and be something they can never be. Can you imagine just why many kids rebel? Put them in a box they can never fit. And it's also coming back to the gambling thing, is because we think we're above average intelligence, because we think we're not as stupid as everybody else's gambles, because we know that everybody else loses, not me. I know the tricks. I know how to tweak that poker machine to give me you know, the, the payouts. I know the chance, I've been to the temples, I've got the good karma, I've got the people telling me what number to put it in it, but don't trust that. Because of that conceit that we can control things, that's again why we gamble. If we were realistic, honest, not conceited, we realize we're wasting our time, we're losing. We're going to lose. So we don't go there to gamble to win because we know we're going to lose. We're not up to that. We haven't got powers. We can't make, sometimes you think you have, you have not got powers. You can't tweak that machine. You're going to lose. You know you're going to lose. Be honest about it. 
awareness of honesty and realism, then of course you can go to the casino and bet your $100, you know you're going to lose, and then have a nice night, and then you go home again. There's no problem, because you never ever thought that you were going to win. And it's the same in life. You know, we, somebody asked me what you know, the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism was. In a nutshell, put it in a simple one, um, one sentence saying, it's asking from the world what it can never give you. What do you ask from the world? Look, what do you ask from your partner? That's the whole cause of marital suffering or relationship suffering. You ask from the person you live with something you can never get. No one can give you that. The perfect guy, the most wonderful girl, who's always there for you, just knows exactly what you want, and who can always entertain you, can always be funny, and would always respect you when you don't want to listen to them, they won't talk to you. And they were always entertaining and bright and good looking. And someone once told me, if that's the sort of person you want in life, then buy a TV. Always entertaining, always funny, you can turn them off whenever you want. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a person, is it? <laughs> but that's what we like. We like a wife who's like a TV. Always can entertain us, give us pleasure, but we can turn her off whenever we're bored with her. <laughs> we would be by ourselves. That's not what life is. So asking from life what it can never give you, the guy, the really strong, macho guy who can always just be there to protect you, look good, take you out, and always know exactly what you want. What you want is a psychic, not a husband. Always knows what you want, for goodness sake. Because so, sometimes you don't know what you want, so you don't give him much of a chance. But asking from life what it can't give you, easy wealth. You can't get wealth easily. You know, if, if that was something which you could do easily, then everybody would be wealthy, and then it wouldn't really matter, would it? And wh why do you want wealth for anyway? What's the point of having so much wealth? Too much wealth is too much problem. And if you just get it too easily, there's no, no value to it at all. When you worked hard for it, then at least you think, well, I've earned this by the sweat of my brow. I'm making good decisions. That's fine. You can enjoy that. But imagine getting money from gambling. You haven't really earned it, have you? It's just luck, that's all. Or is it really luck? But anyway, it's not really a good way of earning money anyway. So, just if you do win any money, just give it away straight away. It gets you into the wrong way. You can't really appreciate it. And anyway, what is this money business anyway? One of my... Actually, I haven't said this in any... I don't have written this a book, it's just come to me, I haven't said this for years, about one of Ajahn Chah's predictions for the future. Now these monks, we don't usually predict the future, but the, he could see actually just how things were going in the world. And he was actually predicting that, you know, sooner or later, you know, we'll actually run out of metal to make coins. That's almost, already almost happening. It's so hard to get pieces of copper or silver to actually to make coins, because there's so many people around. So, we won't have any metal for coins, and we'll even run out of paper, you know, for banknotes. We're getting plastic banknotes already. We'll soon be running out of uh, oil to make that plastic for banknotes. So what will we use for currency? So Ajahn Chah, he saw in the far distant future, instead of using metal and paper for currency, we'll use chicken shit for currency. You know those little balls? Because they're very easy to carry around in the pocket. You know, and you sort of go for a, sort of a cup of coffee, that's ten little balls of chicken shit. <laughs> and when you go to the bank, an ATM will just spit out sort of uh, a few balls of chicken shit, which you can put in your, your pocket and just carry around with you. And then you know, people will be breaking into your houses to, to steal your chicken shit. <laughs> and you know, some people have so much chicken shit, they'll be so proud that they're wealthy, they've made it in life. Look how much chicken shit I've got. <laughs> much more than you've got. And you'll be trading chicken shit on the stock market. And the IMF, of course, will be the International Manure Fund, which uh, hands out chicken shit to, com uh, to, to countries which are, you know, haven't got much chicken shit in their reserves. <laughs> and when you go on like this, well, what is the difference between chicken shit and a coin? A coin is just from the earth, it's just a stone, it's just paper, and this is just chicken shit. What's the difference? It's just the value we give onto it, isn't it? That's all it is, just value. Just paper, that's all. 
So chicken shit is just a shame. So he actually predicted in the future we'd use chicken shit as currency. <laughs> and that was such a wonderful economic argument about how stupid this whole system is. So we give value to things which don't really have value. And because of that we think that the only way to have happiness and uh, well-being and contentment and to get on in life is to collect as much chicken shit as possible. Which means we go to these casinos thinking that that's going to make us happy. No, don't go there to win. You're going to lose anyway. Even if you've got lots of money, you're still going to lose because you're being deceived into what's really important in life. If you go there for fun, marvellous. You understand what's important in life. Have a good day out with your friends or a good evening out. A nice meal afterwards. Yeah, you've had a good day, but you're losing. Expect to lose. That's the meaning of life, being a loser. Losers have much more fun in life. So you lose your attachments, you, you lose your wanting, you lose your having to have all these things. When you don't need all these things, when you can live uh, with just a few things, when you're a loser, you're much more happy. That's why the monks are happy, the nuns are happy. That's why you come here, you see these smiling monks having a good time. We've lost everything. You know, lost all our money, lost all my girlfriends, lost all my guitar. Lost my little motorbike I used to have, my green velvet. I lost everything. I got nothing. I've got no pension. I've lost that too. So we are losers. And I often say, the Buddha behind me, he was the biggest loser. <laughs> no attachments at all. So if anyone comes up to you and says, you're a loser, you say, yes, you've understood I'm a Buddhist. Yeah, we're all losers in Buddhism. We lose all our past, all our future, all our worries, all our anxieties, all our fears, all our cravings. We're just happy. We've lost all that stuff. That's why it's good to go to a casino and lose everything. Then you're happy again. <laughs> lose your wanting. So you can actually just appreciate just being here. You're not going here to win things. That people are more important than things all the time. Please remember that. But what's the most important thing in your life? Your bank account or your kids? Your partner or your salary? What's more important? How many people sacrifice their partner for an increase in their salary by working extra hours? How many people just neglect their kids because they've got to make more money at work? Something's wrong there. It's, more, it's better to be poor and have a happy family than be rich and just have divorces and separation, a kid living over in this country, another kid living with the first mother of the second husband of the third. It's really complicated these days. So because of that, what's really important in life? If you understand what's really important, you can understand the whole of Buddhism. You can understand it's just being at peace, enjoying the people you have, going out, not to win things, but just have a good time together. If you understand that, you go to work, not to become rich, make a service to society, have enough money just to pay the bills. And Look, you don't have to pay that many bills if you don't have such a blooming big house with so many. How many TVs do you need in your house anyway? I mean, these houses, one in the toilet. You know, I must spend a lot of time in the toilet to have a TV in it. You must all be constipated, perhaps because you, know, you do spend too much time watching the TV, you don't have exercise enough. <laughs> you know, what do you want all this stuff for? So, and it, all these mobile phones people have, always going off in the middle of the meditation. That's bad karma, you know. If you're, m imagine if a mobile phone went off under the Bodhi tree just when the Buddha was about to become enlightened. There'd be no Buddha at all. <laughs> be disturbed. <laughs> so be careful. What do you need all this stuff for? You know, in the old days, you used to have these nice little red boxes. You could just actually call somebody, you know, in, along the street. You just had these little phones in the house, just one. And when you went to the temple or the church, or you went out, you couldn't be contacted. Wasn't that wonderful? You could enjoy yourself. No one could get to you. You could have holidays overseas where no one actually could, could actually understand what you were doing. Things would go wrong at home, but they'd fix themselves up. You're not that important. To have a mobile... Okay, President Obama, he could have a mobile phone. But you? Are you running a country? <laughs> so 
But it's just having these stupid mobile phones just because we think, oh, we've got to keep in contact. Yeah, contact with a lot of fools. <laughs> so just let it go, for goodness sake. You don't need all that stuff. So you can actually live quite simply because you understand the most important thing in life is peace, contentment, having time for yourself. So you don't have to keep contacting people. You just go out to the casino, enjoy without having to you know, have these phones ringing all the time. Just you know, interrupting your enjoyment of life. Imagine you're, you're watching a concert. Do you know like these great concerts? I remember the concerts I used to... It would be terrible if you're during the middle of the concert when the music is really building up, you're really enjoying it, and then ding, 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 you've got to answer a mobile phone. I don't know how you do that in some... You know, the last over of a test match. It's drawn the last ball of a 2020. Are they going to win? Ding, 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 ding. That's really awful that people interrupt you at the most interesting points of time. And you miss so much. So when we understand what's really important in life, we can have a lot of fun in life. We can go gaming, but not gambling. We can have a raffle and just have a bit of fun. We're not really worrying about who's winning or losing. It's just having a bit of joy and fun being with your friends, having a good evening out. But when we think we, we want to win, and when we think we can win, when we have this delusion that somehow we can control the future, we think by getting the money it's going to make us happy, please think again. Even people who do win the lottery, they don't enjoy it. Just look at the research which has been done. People who win the lottery, there's many, many times, it's standard, they think, oh, I wish I hadn't have won it. It's the worst thing which happened to me in my whole life. You lose all your friends for a start. You're afraid of them asking for money. You just go underground, because if somebody found out it was you who won all that money. I remember one of the monks telling me that this guy in Thailand had the illegal lottery, just two numbers. And if you get those last two numbers, then you win, I think, 50 to 1 or 6, I forget what the odds were. And this guy had a dream, and he thought this was a number, and he put his whole, sold his whole house to buy this number. It won. And he was supposed to get something like 50 million. But all these illegal lotteries, all run by mafia and triads, and these really evil people. So the guy said, no, we'll give you a million. But I want 50 million. Look, we'll give you a million. I want 50 million. I want my 50 million. And a guy said, look, a bullet only costs 10 cents. Take a million or else. He refused to take that million. He got crazy, was admitted to hospital. It drove him insane. It's amazing, when greed gets into people, they just can't see what's really happening. And greed for what? Somebody told me there was a movie with this fellow called Lizard or something, no, Gecko, Gecko. And he, he coined the phrase, greed is good. What was that film called? Wall Street. Greed is good. And I agree with him. Greed is good. <laughs> for the right things. Not money or wealth. But greed for time. With your family. Greed for happiness. Greed for contentment. So see how much peace and happiness you can actually grab in life. How much meaning you can find. Be greedy for that. Gre greedy for good health. Peace of mind. If that, if people work that hard for peace of mind, happiness, mutual respect, looking after one another, greed for just having fun, just you know, playing with. I just remember those times with my brother and my father. You know, we were playing while my mother was making the dinner, just for pocket money, having great time with your dad, not taking it too seriously. You know, cheating sometimes, but you know, just for fun. <laughs> Yeah, just to share it out afterwards. You confess, sorry, I did that. And it's just fun and games, which you remember for the rest of your life. Now, that was more important than anything else. The beautiful memories you've had in your life. Why? What were they? And you find that those are the moments you should be greedy for. Make more of them. You understand that is the meaning of life. And as far as gambling is concerned, it's not gambling, it's gaming. Enjoying your life, having fun together. Not saying you're going to win, but just enjoying the journey, not the goal. So please don't go around gambling. Destroys families, destroys... And 
You think you can control when you can't. Just let it all go. And just have fun. Just like the monks. So that's the talk this evening. Straight from Las Vegas. Ajahn Brahm. On gaming and gambling. Thank you for listening. <laughs> okay, we've got some questions here. And I... Okay. And I never actually went to the strip. I was too afraid because I'm too well known now. If someone took a photograph of me outside the casino, that would be it. Even if I told them, I was just going for a look, they'd say, yeah, we've heard that one before. Here we go. First question from Bangkok. Is buying a government lottery ticket of, or, of the... Sorry, is buying a government lottery ticket or the government saving bank's lottery ticket considered gambling? Does it break any of the five precepts? If you're doing that because you think the government has not got enough money and needs some charity, fine. <laughs> but you already pay your taxes for that. So it's not breaking the five precepts, but it's, not being, it's being a bit stupid. So if it's like buying like a raffle ticket for the nuns monastery, which is coming up next week, and it's just, you no know, chance of you getting a prize of zero, but you just buy it, buy it anyway, just for fun. It's like a way of making a donation and getting a bit of enjoyment out of it, a lot of harmony. That's really good. So no, all the people in Bangkok listening to this, please don't buy a lottery ticket this week for the government. Please buy a raffle ticket for the Dharmasara Nuns Sala Fund building, whatever it is. Very cheap. You won't win, but you'll have a lot of fun afterwards. That's much better. Stephen from Singapore. What can I do to help reduce old people's mindset to minimise gambling on 4D Singapore pool. I don't know what 4D Singapore... Four digits, okay. Old people's mindset, again, it's the people who are superstitious. The more superstitious you are, the less educated, the more you really think you're going to win. You are stupid. S-T-U-P-I-D, stupid. And I mean that because you will lose. And trouble is that some people, especially like, unfortunately I have to say this, Chinese people are very superstitious and they love gambling. Now this was going to be a way I could legitimately raise funds for the Buddhist Society in Las Vegas, which I did suggest to people. And that was, I know in the Chinese tradition that to see a monk before you go gambling is considered to be very bad luck. Very, very bad luck. So if you see a monk on the way to the casino. So I did actually contemplate, and I told a few people this in uh, Bodhinyana Monastery before I left, that my plan was actually to stand in front of one of the casinos on the strip like Caesar's Palace, just to stand in front of Caesar's Palace in the casino, not to go in, just to stand there, because any Chinese people would go in there, would take one look at me and think, oh God, here's a monk, I won't win, and they'll go next door. And when the management would find out that not many people were going into the casino because I was standing there, they'd ask me to move on, but I'd only move on if they gave me a fat check. And then I'd actually move on to the casino next door so the customers would come back to them as well. And that way I can go from one casino to after the other, make a lot of money for the Buddhist society to build our nuns sala. And at the same time, I'd be doing good karma because I'm actually stopping people going in. <laughs> that was my good idea until someone suggested, look, they won't give you a check to move on. They'll just get one of these three or four gorillas who work as security <laughs> in those casinos and they will explain the matter to you. <laughs> so with a four-digit gambling in Singapore, look, you're not going to win. You're wasting your money. You know, look, be smart, don't be stupid. There's no way that going to temples, you know, going to ask monks for prayers, going to have amulets or doing anything else which is supposed to be lucky. That is superstition. That does not work. So you do not have an edge over other people. You are not somehow different that you can win what other people can't. Don't go looking for signs somewhere in the sky. Or, you know, sometimes I make holy water and people look for the, you know, how many pieces of wax fall in there, whether they form letters or whatever happens. That is not going to work. How many times does Ajahn Brahm just wipe his nose? That's four times, so four is the first number. Don't do that. That's not going to work. 
So people do that. They think they can see the signs. There is omens. There is something out there. There are no omens. There are no signs. Don't think that you somehow are clever. You can work it out. Don't go to fortune tellers to try and predict the numbers or the horse which is going to come up. Listen, if a fortune... I was in Hong Kong and they had a whole street of fortune tellers. They all, no, they weren't, you know, having big limousines pick them up. They weren't wearing sort of designer clothes. They were poor people. If fortune tellers can't tell their own fortune, damn it, they can't tell yours. <laughs> Never trust a poor fortune teller. <laughs> so when they do that, go to these fortune tellers thinking somehow or other they're going to tell you what the lucky number is. If they knew what the number was, they wouldn't be telling you. They'd buy it themselves. That's just like... Stockbrokers. No stockbrokers, they don't gamble on the market themselves. They just advise you. If they really knew which stocks were going up, which ones were going down, they wouldn't take your money. They bank so much money themselves. But they tell you what to invest, what to invest. Now that's very smart. Because they don't they know they get money from you, whatever happens. If they invest their own money, they'd always lose. Be careful. And who's advising you to buy what? If they really knew, they wouldn't be working in an office from nine to five. They'd be so wealthy, they'd have retired already. Be careful. So, old people, sometimes old people, it's past it, so you can't really do much about it. Just, you know, restrict, you know, take over their bank accounts, make sure they can't cash very much, give them maybe $10 or $20, and that's it, just to keep them happy. But be careful, because that's, that's your inheritance going. <laughs> and Boris from Moscow. It's, it's really good. We get from all over the world. We've got Bangkok, Singapore, and Moscow. Hi, I have heard that gambling, or for that matter, most addictions are triggered by emotional difficulties, both from childhood and ongoing life difficulties. What is your thought of this? Sometimes there is a certain excitement in gambling, which when you were excited, like just going to a movie or going to a, a football match or something, when it's exciting, it means we can forget our daily concerns. But instead of going to a gambling or a casino if you're getting bored, come to the Buddhist Society in Western Australia. It's very exciting here and good fun listening to all the stories from the monks and all the bad jokes. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But no, sometimes people do that just to escape, and there's many ways of escaping. Mostly it's through alcohol or drugs. Because when you're drunk or when you're doped up or when you're excited with gambling, you're not thinking about the problems of your life, and sometimes that is an escape mechanism. But look, you know, money doesn't last that long, and it goes so quickly. Which is why that, yeah, for gambling it can be... Sometimes it's desperation, they think they've got nothing to lose, they're just so poor anyway, but they do e lose even more. There's, there's no limit on what you can lose. There's one of our members here, uh, he was a... Uh, he worked in the local casino, and he told me some disgusting stories of what happened. And this was from a fellow who actually worked there. He said that sometimes there was you know, some of these loan sharks, they'd be watching people to see who were the addicted gamblers, you know, who were, really thought they were going to win because they were superstitious, not well educated. They'd either go to a temple, they'd make some, some pledge or with some god or something, saying, please help me, they thought they were going to win, and they get into trouble. When they lose their money, these loan sharks, they were there for loaning them some money, right inside the casino. And they loan them a bit more, and a bit more, and a bit more, until they get so far in debt, they usually choose the pretty Asian girls. And says, okay, you owe me you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Come and work for me. You know the job they have to do, prostitution. If you don't do that, we'll break your leg. And your kids' legs as well. He was saying that actually happens in casinos here in Perth. He said he's seen it. Non-substantiated, obviously, but I'm sure that probably does occur. People taking advantage of stupid people. When I heard that, it's disgusting. Sometimes these things which happen. When you get into such big debt, and that really is going into hell. That's why one of the Buddha's words were, it's a gateway into a hell. It's very dangerous. If it's gaming, you're in control, fine. Don't go there to win. Go there to lose. 
If you go there to lose, now you're going to lose. It's just a bit of fun. There's no problem. Thinking you can win, and thinking that somehow or other the odds are going to change for you, that somehow you can control the future, that is the myth. You can't control these things in life. You can't control your partner. You can't control the weather. There's many other risks we have to take, but that is a risk which is stupid risk. So, difficulties from childhood, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes there's a self-destructive part of ourselves. We think we're not good enough. Therefore, we just look for things to destroy ourselves, destroy our happiness. No need for that. There's other ways of dealing with the difficulties of childhood. And you all know that way. You let things go. That's what you learn here in this place. How to let things go. Whatever happened to you in the past, a lot of times it wasn't your fault. So why do you allow other people's bad actions to make you unhappy? I don't know why people do that. They take on the bad karma of others. You didn't do anything at all. You were okay. You were good. So why do you allow other people's bad karma, the bad things they said and did done to you, why do you keep those in your heart? And of course, there's many, many ways, but I won't go into that now because the time is up. How to let go of things. Oh, we well, you know that way which I've been teaching a lot, the toilet, pa toilet paper method. Because when I was in Toronto... I gave a, a talk in the University of Toronto for the Department of Buddhism, Psychology and Medicine, a whole department really getting Buddhism mainstream into uh, psychology and medicine. And this was actually part of their, their um, course. So all the students, you know, plus uh, the drop-ins who were, wanted to hear a talk, they all had to come and they would have to to uh, part of their assignment was to do a synopsis of my talk, which is going to be counting to their degree. So this was uh, one of the things I did over there. And that's where I mentioned how to let go of the past. I'm sure I've said this before, but you may have forgotten. It's basic psychology. If you've got some pain of the past, you have to let go of. Usually something which somebody did to you, or it could be something which you did, you feel very ashamed of. You have to acknowledge it first of all, which means bringing it up. And the best way of bringing it up is writing it down on a piece of paper. And that's standard psychology, where I've added things, because we always adapt and add it and make it more powerful. It's a type of paper you use to write it down on, which in my method is toilet paper. So if you have done something very bad or something which happened to you, write it down clearly, legibly in toilet paper, preferably on brown ink. <laughs> and then you make the association of what usually goes on toilet paper. And these are the bad memories of things which you've done, or what more likely what people have done to you. You write it down on toilet paper, you have a look at it, read it again, and the association is this is not something you should keep. How many of you wipe your ass with toilet paper and put it in your bag or your pocket and take it home with you? I know we're supposed to re recycle things, but recycling toilet paper goes a bit too far. Even though that sometimes in the GFC, many companies actually did advise their, 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 their workers, please use both sides of the toilet paper. We need to save money. <laughs> You've got half a side you're not using. What a waste of a resource. And anyway, <laughs> so you write it down on toilet paper and browning. It is shitty stuff. That's the association, which means you know it should be let go of the past. And then you take it to the toilet bowl and you do the letting go ceremony. <laughs> so you put it in the bowl, press the button, bye bye. And that, okay, that's funny which is why you remember it, but what it really means is you make the associations and you actually do something. So just saying, oh, let it go, for goodness sake. It's not your fault. You know, you didn't do anything wrong. doesn't work, does it? But doing a ceremony, doing something physical, helps the letting go. You write it down, read it, go to the toilet bowl, put it in. It all goes down the hole. Bye-bye. The association is so strong, it makes it much easier to let go of the pain of the past. The toilet paper, an original Ajahn Brahm, which is causing so many blocked toilets around the world. <laughs> I should get 10% from the plumber. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so don't go gambling to let go of those problems from your childhood. Just do the toilet paper simile, a method.
of letting go, and then it's much easier. So thank you all for listening today, and I hope you enjoyed what's going on here and addressing real problems in people's lives, especially with gambling. Gaming, okay, gambling. Don't go to win. Go to have fun. Don't think that you can tweak the odds. You're an ordinary person, no better than anybody else. So don't think that somehow you have the technique to win. You have not. Have fun. Game, but not gamble. Remember, money is not the most important thing in life. People are. Your health, your happiness, your contentment. Thank you for listening. It's hard. Oh, come on. I was only about two or three weeks I was gone. If you say three sadhus, you have to do them with energy and effort. Okay, ready? Sadhu. 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 You see, otherwise you get depressed.